This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Script to Screen presenting Sylvius in Seattle. Uh, tonight is a very special night. We have Jeff Hart, the screenwriter, who will take us in a deeper look at this classic film. Hopefully explain to me how he got uh, the studio executives to allow Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan not to meet to the end of the movie. <laughs> and, uh, they wouldn't make the decision today. And they didn't want to make it then either. So, so, uh, so what was it like seeing us sleepless in the theater after 20 years? There aren't words. Honest to God, I'm so bewildered and knocked out by this whole thing. It's, uh, it's like looking at home movies. And uh, I mean, when I saw the uh, names and the credits in the beginning, it's like I saw the faces, and, but we were all 20 years younger. It's just uh, pretty bizarre. Uh, since writing the film, do you have friends, Facebook acquaintances, and stalking fans who want dating advice on how to meet somebody over the radio? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who asks me for dating advice is really in trouble. <laughs> it's just you gotta ask anybody else first, and, you know. Um, obviously, destiny and magic is a big part of your theme. Uh, what attracted you to that theme when you were writing it? Well, this, for students here, especially, I don't think you start out with theme at all. I don't think you should even know what the theme is of what you're writing. I started out with a story problem, which is. Uh, when you start out to write a love story, you have to know right away before you even start what's going to keep two people apart. So I got very frustrated thinking of what would keep two people apart. And, um, you know, the normal way is I just didn't buy it. You know, uh, they meet cute, they bicker for 60 pages, and then he, re you know, each one makes a mistake and realizes they're better off, you know, they're not better off without the other one. There's music, they all race to the airport, <coughs> you know, and it's over. Uh, I don't know anybody in real life who, who argued like that with somebody before they got into the relationship. Usually, <laughs> you know, you know in, in real life, um, if you reject a guy and he shows up at your office the next day in a gorilla suit, um, you know, you call 911. In a movie, it's all romantic and everything. So I couldn't find a way to do it conventionally, and I got very frustrated, and I just said, well, screw it, man. What if they don't meet? And then that sounded kind of neat. And I thought, well, okay, they won't meet, but they'll meet on the last page on the top of the Empire State Building on Valentine's Day. And if I could tell you how that idea happened, I, I just don't know. I got really lucky. But then it was a story. From there on, it was kind of simple because every decision, you have 120 pages, <clears throat> and every decision is, does this get them to the top of the Empire State Building on page 120 or not? So if it didn't, I threw it out. Well, I mean, if you look at the end when he says, shall we? Yeah. Uh, it was a great moment because I did see some people crying in the audience. So I won't signal you out. But, Take uh, names. But it, I mean, the payoff clearly to me was the fact that they didn't meet and we had that moment. Yeah. This, like you said, the studio didn't like the idea. I was told by everybody a hundred times over, you're not going to do a love story where the people don't meet. And I said, well, yeah, I think you can if you do it right. And they panicked a couple of times during the development of it. They had me write a draft where they sort of do meet in the beginning, and then something happens, and then they meet again at the end, still on the Empire State Building. It was ridiculous. You know, but I did it. Then they realized it doesn't work this way. You've got to go back. Somebody's got to have the guts. That's where Nora came in. What they, what they didn't believe from me, they believed from her, because she made people believe things. And it probably, I'm assuming with the studio executive, once Tom and May got assigned, they're like, oh, you have to have that, those two together. Uh, there was pressure all the way through. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And, and actually, I don't, I don't think they thought very much was going to happen with this movie. If they thought the stakes were that big, they absolutely would have stopped it. So, it's one of the advantages, almost under the radar. Yeah. It, it was a little romantic comedy. I mean, they were pushing what are this, some, some big um, cliffhanger. It's a Stallone movie. One of the ones we weren't talking about in the other. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> But that was their big movies, Cliffhanger and So I Married an Axe Murder were their big movies, and we snuck in under that, and Cliffhanger did okay, Axe Murder disappeared, and we were the surprise. 
I, one of my favorite relationships is the father-son dynamic. Mm-hmm. You know, having the son kind of be the one that brings everybody together. Was that always the kind of the heart of it, or that was the heart? I my um, my own son was about six months old when I wrote this, so I didn't. Uh, my daughter was four and a half, and I just remember thinking, if if I get on film the way she and I talk to each other, I'm going to be all right. So that's pretty much me and her. Oh. Okay. And, and she still knows more than I do about everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite moment was Jonah says, uh, I'm sorry to forget mom. Uh, that was one of the critical. Did, did that take a while to evolve, or was that something like something you thought of? Starting to forget her is a really easy one. That scene was just... Uh, um, that just, the, once it looked like they're hard to write, that was a very easy one to write. I mean, I've gone in and talked to my kids when they had nightmares before. The whole idea when they have a nightmare is go in and talk to them. So it came easily after that. It's not really what's written here, but... Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's one of the early drafts. Uh, but it was, it was a great moment. It really kind of set up, you know. And actually, I talked to Tom about that, you know, me and Tom. I talked to him about that, and uh, I got a really sweet note from him because I just said, how you pulled off that scene? And he told me that he was really concerned about it the night before, and it never occurred to me that like actors like do that. He was really worried about how he was going to play that scene the night before, and then when he did it, he said, it's just, it's just so natural. So you get out of the way, and if you structure the scene right, it almost doesn't matter what they say. And really, our introduction to Jonah was when he called uh, the radio and says, uh, my dad needs a new wife, not I need a new mom. Right. And that was, to me, one of the best starting points for a character. Thanks. Is that where you kind of grab, that's where you... Originally, this is how it happens. Originally, I had uh, Sam calling, uh, and I had to set up all this. Back in 1990, the idea of uh, a guy calling a radio station, so we had to do all this stuff to defend why he called, and we had a lot of drafts where he calls. We had, like, you can still be a man and call a radio psychologist in 1990, and... um, Somebody's, Gary, the producer's secretary, yelled out from the other room, we're trying to solve this problem. And he said, why doesn't the kid call? So, (laughs) sure, make the kid call. And that's how that happened. So originally, it wasn't my idea to have, it was, Sam was going to try all these things. And then suddenly, okay, I'll try one last thing. But it worked way better from a, you know, somebody's assistant, who's no longer anybody's assistant. And the thing about the scene, though, there's so much going on. Tom, uh, we, you know, tr- opening up to for a new wife. You have the mm-hmm. son looking for her mom. Meg Ryan kind of, you know, falling in love immediately on the phone. Was there any challenges having all those characters kind of evolving? And No, the cool thing there was that um, even though it was a completely unconventional way of telling a story, they still meet at the same part of a conventional romantic comedy where they would meet. It's just they don't meet together. I mean, she hears them on the radio. That's their meeting. So underneath all this unconventional stuff was a very conventional story structure. I thought Meg was terrific in that scene because she's in a car. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was almost confining for her as an actress, but she delivered a wonderful performance. Um, now, when I hire a private investigator and stalk women <laughs> to Seattle, I get arrested <laughs> and a restraining order. You write a scene and Meg Ryan gets away with it and it's endearing and well, cute. You know, it's interesting because we're doing this um, as a musical now. And I had to go and revisit all these story problems, all these, how do you tell this, why this, how do you do that? And it really occurred to us, um, if you flip this, I mean, this occurred to me a long time ago, if you flip this and have a guy doing this, oh my God. He he lies to his fiance. He takes the company money to go on a business trip that isn't where he said he was going. He stalks this woman. Um, But where the detective came from is that at the time, I remember reading an article in the Washington Post about... um, people were at the time just starting to get detectives to check up on people they were dating. Mm. Uh, and now, I mean, look, it's, you know, it's, they would Google them in five seconds, they'd be on Facebook and be all over. But then, you know, I mean, they still had phones with cords and they still had this clunky, they didn't have color monitors at this point. So using what was available at the time, how would she do it? She would hire a detective, take that step first before she committed to going all the way out there. It was a wonderful blend of believability and romance because it, you know, it was kind of a fine line. Did it take a few drafts to reach the point where it was... Didn't, I, I got to tell you, this one, it didn't take a hell of a lot. I wrote this thing in like three and a half weeks with two little kids, two other jobs, and the flu. Um, I don't know. <laughs> they have not been this easy since. I keep, I keep, you know, and I just wrote it in such a damn hurry because I was convinced 
this is, you know, something's going to catch up with me and I'm going to be wrong. Uh, well, it sounds like it was magic. Uh, <laughs> I got lucky. <laughs> now, you had the son really pushing Tom towards love, and, but you also, I mean, you had her friends, but you didn't have that like, central character pushing Meg Ryan. It's almost like she discovered her own with a little push from Rosie O'Donnell. Again, we, we sort of switched it now where Rosie's much more of the Cupid and Rosie's much more of the driving force in the musical version because when I went back and um, I had a problem with the ethics of this. So some of this is Rosie pushing her, is the Becky character pushing her, and everything just sort of... Um, it's much more organic and much more kind of understandable the way it happens now. I, I, you know, calling somebody a hoe, I did not write that scene. I know it got a lot of laughs, but uh, that really made, so we took that out. That made me kind of uncomfortable. Oh, for the musical. Are we going to do a musical number or are we just... You and I, <laughs> you wanna, when it's time to clear the room, we'll, we'll do a musical number. Uh, what was your action when Nora Ephron, writer of Silkwood and Harry Met Sally, got attached to the whole... I was, I was happy about it because it was clear they weren't going to go with me because I, I was a rookie writer and uh, I made the same arguments that she did but again, they don't believe, you know, if they hired Nora Ephron and they hired David Ward before that and if you make a mistake and you're the executive, well, what can they do? They hired Nora Ephron and David Ward. Um, if they listen to me and went the whole way and the thing flops, then it's like, why did you listen to this guy? So uh, Nora, when Nora got attached, it was sort of like uh, in, in, in slot machines when that first thing stopped spinning. And then, then Nora got Tom to do it because, again, it was really hard to get a guy uh, to do like a sensitive role like that. They were uh, so afraid that it was going to be sentimental. That was like a nasty word, sentimental. I don't know. It seemed to work. And what about Meg Ryan? And the, uh Meg wanted to do it from the beginning. From my very first draft, she wanted to do it, and she came and went it several times. It was about a two-year development process. So at one point, I mean, I was just getting these hilarious phone calls. Daryl Hannah wants to do it. Madonna wants to do it. Kim Basinger wants to do it. It was like, that's great. But I held out, you know, in my heart, I held out for Meg because, I mean, you'd be crazy not to. She was Harry Met Sally. I mean, if you're writing a romantic comedy in 1990, you want Meg Ryan. No, that's fantastic. And uh, I fail to remember... Is that something? Yeah. Uh, where, where did that come? Clean classic film in the modern um, retelling. And I watched that movie in college with a girl, and um, <laughs> I was just about to. I mean, I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just about to turn to her and say, "What a bunch of horseshit this thing is! I can't believe it!" <laughs> and I turned to her, and she's crying. <laughs> and going nuts, and um, I remember saying to her, I mean, God, this was like 1974, I remember saying to her, in this long ago distant future of 1980, you know, <laughs> if we're not with anybody, I'll meet you on the top of the Empire State Building on New Year's. So sort of, that happened in 74, 75, so, you know, writers in the room, you got to remember this stuff. And do you really cry during the Dirty Dozen? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he, he, the hair. I'm sorry. <laughs> How can you not cry during the Dirty Dozen? How can he? My God. I mean, I'm sorry. You have no heart. No heart. It, it was uh, actually Tom Hanks tells a funny story where he criticized. He makes a joke about a fan of remember, and Rita Wilson, who played you know the woman that seemed crying, says, "What about you and Field of Dreams when you cry?" And he's oh, like, "Don't mess with that for me." You know, he, yeah. So we all have guys had the movie too. Uh, um, so Seattle and Baltimore. What was the decision for those cities and, you know, and how they shape your, you know, your characters? Seattle was first right away. When I, when I heard those words in my head, sleepless in Seattle, I just, oh my God, I just knew something big was about to happen. If I could figure out the rest, you know, I had the title and I had the ending. I just had to figure out how to get there. But uh, ba originally, I'm from central Pennsylvania, so originally she was from Lancaster yep. in, in Dutch country. And we went location scouting there. And at the time, I'm not kidding, Kim Basinger was attached, and uh, Meg Ryan was not. It was going to be Dennis Quaid and Kim Basinger. And we got to Lancaster, and we're looking around, and we realized nobody as pretty as Kim Basinger could possibly come from this place. <laughs> <laughs> so we um, made it Baltimore. That's, I mean, just little decisions like that. And New York City was a no-brainer for you then? The, uh, That's where they put the Empire State Building. Ah. <laughs> You know, it, it's amazing that she falls in love with his voice, but he, he actually says very little lines to her. Yeah. It was a fascinating. Was that, were you conscious of that? or You know, um, you write the scenes and you trust the actors. 
the, the less they say, the less you give them to say, the more you give them to do, the more you let them act, the better. So I really, that was a really wordy script to me. I try and like really stay out of the way and just give them the minimum they need to do what they got to do. So you're a big fan of like the nonverbal action description and the screen, for screenwriters, keeping in the actors kind of. I, you know, at one point when I'm really great at this, the script will have no words on it. I'm just trying so hard to get less and less and less, less descriptions, less dialogue, to just try and make it. Um, the only problem is when you have really short lines and everything like we do in the, in the musical version is that actors tend to read them fast because they're short. Mm. So we got to go, hey, slow down. This is, this is late at night. You're drinking. You know, this is not, you know, rat-a-tat. But, um, yeah, I just like <coughs> nice short speeches, get it done. Was there anything like you really were amazed? Anything that Tom Hanks brought in to your character? You said, "Wow, that was an amazing choice he, he made." Or? He brought a lot. How he carried himself physically. He he wrote a lot of his own stuff. You know, he took the scene and and just he's a good writer himself. And I think he directed himself in it. I mean, no one. We were talking before. No no one can tell him how to do with your body posture what he does in that in that movie. He just gradually gets taller. You know, the whole the whole way through. He's just hunched over in the beginning, and he figured that out. You know, I, I certainly didn't say the actor gets taller. <coughs> you know, you just you just trust. You get good people, and you trust. So uh, you sound like you're very pleased when Tom uh, joined. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, who wouldn't be? Yeah. Uh, so what, let's take it for your aspiring writer. Today. What is your writing process? Let's you know, <laughs> we, we we get the bag of Dorito chips. We start in the morning. What do we do? Uh, I once wrote a poem about Doritos when I was writing, and um. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it evolves. I mean, at the time I was doing that, I was writing like three scripts at a time, six days a week, probably 10 or 11 hours a day, and never stopping just to, to, do, um, uh, to develop a body of work. Now it's, you know, I know how to do three weeks of work in one week, but I've also learned how to do one week's worth of work in three weeks, you know, and just slow down a little bit, and I can only write one thing at a time now. But um, the process is it's in your head constantly. It never leaves your head. And uh, you got to sit in the chair and you got to do it. But when you're not doing it, you're still doing it. I mean, again, <laughs> we have a scene in the musical that I've been resisting for like two weeks. And I'm sitting watching this thing going, okay, now how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? Never goes away. Just constant chatter. And uh, do you like to write backstories for your characters or nah. do you no character just jump right in? Usually they'll say something in a scene. I, I, everybody's different. I mean, some people got to index card the entire thing. And... Um, and they get the boards and, you know, how to organize your thinking and everything. And then some people just say, I don't want to know any of that stuff. It's just all going to be discovery. Uh, eventually, in the course of writing something, I will have done a little bit of all of those things. At some point, I go, okay, I got to organize my brain here, so I'm going to do some index cards. I always get a whole pack. I use, like, four of them. I get bored. I put them away. I never find the rest of them, so I got to go get another pack. And, and, um, but I, whatever gets you to the next thing is what you have to do. So everybody's got a different process, but it's got to involve sitting there and doing it. So any advice for our aspiring screeners to write the next awesomely emotional script like this? Don't try and write somebody else's. Just write, write your own and um, write the one only you can write. And, uh, you know, you got to find a way to be authentic and true about it. you got to get people to turn the page. That's really the only advice I have is figure out how to get people to turn the page. That's your only job. It's very simple. I think it was interesting when you told the story about your girlfriend back in the fair to remember. It's actually important to remember those kind of moments because they will be in scripts later. You know, this came, <clears throat> the houseboat in Seattle came because I saw an episode of This Old House and it was like in its second year in 1980 or something and he went out to check somebody's houseboat in Seattle and I thought, well, that's pretty cool, houseboat in Seattle, you know, I'll remember that. Um, and... 78, I was in New York and I noticed that the Empire State Building was lit up orange and uh, I said, what's that for? And they said, Halloween. And the next night, like the frickin' Yankees won something and it was blue and white. And so I got it in my head, wow, they can change the color of the Empire State Building. So I, don't, I can't do the math, but from 78 to 90, um, I thought, this will be really cool. I'm going to get them to light the Empire State Building up pink for Valentine's Day. And uh, that's the kind of challenge I live on. And that's the kind of stupid thing that I will get involved in to, get myself motivated to do something like, how cool is that? Get them to light up the Empire State Building from my room without talking to anybody. I've that's a dream. Uh, that's a, such a thrill. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned a little bit of the musical. Is there anything you added, scenes you added, or things that maybe it was the original script? Or? 
it, it was more about how to condense everything, take things away, yeah. and still tell the same story because, um, again, you have 120 pages in a movie script. In a musical, I think we have something like 90 or 95 pages, and half of that has to be song. So I'm building like entrance ramps and exit ramps, you know, in and out of these songs. Like every page and a half, I gotta have a song. Uh, or within a song, I can drop in six or seven lines of dialogue while they do their patter kind of thing. But it's been a completely different challenge, but it's still how you tell a story. With given the tools you have, given now you have a space and you have a stage and you have live people, so you can't cross cut. I can't do the tricks that I did uh, in a screenplay. If I can't figure out the end of a Seattle scene, I just go, okay, what's happening in Baltimore now? And I do that. And I go, I got run tired of that. Okay, what's happening in Seattle? Uh, on a stage, I don't have that opportunity. So come and see it. Figure out how we figured out, how we solved those problems. Sounds like you, your theme is less is more. Keep always, try to tell your story as short, you know, and concise as possible. It's more about get out of the way. It's really about, I mean, any, anybody who does any of this as an artist or a craft, you just get out of the way. And, and let the thing happen as simply as possible. Some things come out really verbose and all that stuff. If that's the way they come out, that's, that's fine. Uh, I just try and, uh, I mean, even in the musical, Annie had lots of speeches. I mean, I love watching her mind go. So she'd have these, you know, take up this much room on a page. And then I'd hear the actress do it, and we'd hear him doing it, and I'd just, you know what, this is slowing things down. So I'd take that and chunk it down to maybe two lines where it used to be six, but you still capture the essence of this girl whose brain just starts taking these trips. Like with the, in this thing, it was the cows and the, you know, she just would make her just make these leaps. And uh, so it's like how to preserve the integrity of that given a different platform. Was any of the characters more challenging to convert to music with Jonah, you know, Meg or Tom? Or no, not at all. They all just, at the hopefully appropriate time, start singing. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Which so, and you know, in the movie, the songs were sort of being sung for them. You know, mm -hmm. you'd play a music, they'd play "Bye Bye Blackbird," and that would connect these two with a certain mood. Uh, and and a, in a play, you, they have to sing what's in their hearts, the things they can't say to each other. And it's been an interesting process. I don't think I'll ever do it again. <laughs> so no other uh, uh, scripts you want to turn into musicals or? Not if I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I'm really independent and really, really ferociously protective of what's on that page. And I just did not like sharing it with, uh, you know, a composer and a, and a lyric writer. They did a great job. They're doing a great job. And we figured out how to do it. But it's just really kind of not in my nature to, um, to share that page. So that's why I probably wouldn't do it again. I mean, I love the experience of putting on this play. I don't really like the experience of writing a three-page scene, having half of it removed to have a song, then figuring out how to get the absolute most important thing that I need back in it and keep it funny and keep it moving and not have anybody feel like they're being told a story. I hate exposition. I just I <laughs> hate it. You know? and, and so I try and write things so that you don't find out what you're finding out. You're just carried along emotionally. It's really hard to do with, and when you have this much room instead of three pages. It's interesting you say that because the exhibition thing, you did a great job at the beginning of the movie when he's kind of yelling at the coworker mm -hmm. as a way of explaining his wife died yeah. and everything about it. But it felt because he was so angry and upset. It was actually very clever. Good note for screenwriters. Try that. You know, the, uh, it's, it almost, it, there, an argument is the best way. To, is one of the best ways to get an argument or uh, um, actually an argument because anger and, you know, a heated conversation can get out the information. I just watched one of the Austin Powers movies and how he does exposition in that <laughs> thing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's every writer's problem. How do, you, how do you tell the audience what they need to know without boring the crap out of them? And, and uh, I mean, everybody in the story knows what's going on, but the people watching it don't. So there's many phony moments of exposition where, you know, how long has it been since we've seen each other? I mean... Two friends know that. You know, at, at this age, I'm starting to forget how long it's been since I've seen certain people, but, you know, at this age. Now, uh, but Bill Pullman's character was interesting because you have to balance him because you didn't want to make him, what usually romantic economies do, really a bad guy or, you know, he was a likable yeah. guy. He just I wanted them both to be likable, viable characters. Um, I didn't want to make cartoons out of them. I wanted them to be people that... You know, um, Sam being a really practical guy, he could have ended up with her. And uh, Annie was about to end up with Walter. I didn't want them to have any, like, giant flaws or anything. It's just that we know, don't do it. There's somebody else. Don't do it. So I just, I was pretty, 
one, you know, pretty frustrated with my career at that point, so I wanted to mess with people's heads for quite a while, and, and you know, you're not going to get what you want. You want these people together, it's not going to happen. I'm going to mess with the elevators, I'm going to do everything I can to make you think this isn't going to happen, because it took 11 years to have a career. Yeah, I was watching some of the audience uh, at the end of the film when the elevator doors closed and Meg went down. I saw a couple people I hadn't seen the movie before get upset, thinking that's how you you're going to end it. We had a test screening in uh, about six months before the thing opened. We had a test screening in Pasadena, and it was in the front of the theater where regular people, focus group people for the test screening, and there were a lot of movie like executives behind us, so people that in the business who work with story all the time. And when those elevator things were happening, I heard this woman behind me going, oh, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I thought we were sunk. <laughs> you know, I thought we were sunk. I thought she was going to, you know, she was being cynical about it. I turned around. <laughs> she was a mess. You know. I knew we had a hit. You know, she, just, she was gone. So they didn't make you any changes after the test screening? It just worked? And what they did with the test, when, when uh, Peter Goober saw the test screening, that's when he got involved. That's when they thought, oh, my gosh, maybe this isn't some little sleeper movie. Maybe we have to create a sleeper movie. So that's when he, uh, he got, that's when the studio really got behind it. And uh, that's when they got Celine Dion to do the When I Fall in Love duet. And they mm -hmm. said, let's, let's throw some money at this this time. So I assume then Tom and Meg weren't taking a huge salary originally. It was huge for the time. I think he got um, $7 million and she got five wow. in 1990, 92. And uh, and they still are mad. I keep getting statements about why I'm not getting money. because they keep getting money. So <laughs> the thing is, booked something like $350 million, something global, and uh, there's no profit yet. And it does really well in DVD sales and Blu-ray. still does. And the home yeah. market is uh, still exploding checks, with this film. You know, and, and if people are pirating it in China or something, but I'm still getting checks. And it's just amazing. And 20 years later, I would write a scene, and um, the composers would find, s and we'd, uh, we'd talk, and the composers would find some jumping off point in the scene for where they thought the song, you know, we would talk about in the scene, there has to be a song, and it's got to be about this. But, you know, they had a lot of freedom to use whatever was in the scene as a, as a springboard. And a lot of things, I would write these just really long monologues that were never going to be, and, and they would take from those monologues, uh, and a lot of those monologues would end up in the lyrics only, you know, shaved down for music. So it was, I would write a scene, they, you know, we would discuss what the song needed to be about and what had to be accomplished in the song because a decision has to be made in every song that moves the thing forward. So um, it, it really is, it, it really is a great collaboration. There haven't been you know, any, any, any fights between us or anything. It's just me as a writer not wanting to give up that space. And, and uh, I'm, I'm doing one, uh, another musical with using um, the catalog of the rock band Chicago. And in this case, I sort of have, they, the lyrics are already written and I have permission to do what I want with them. So, I mean, all those songs are guy songs but there have to be other characters, so I have different characters singing songs. I have to change pronouns a lot. I have to change attitudes a lot, but I don't have to get anybody's permission and, uh, or, or uh, cooperation. I just put it in there. But this, this was, it's been a great process, and if I wanted to do this again, definitely I got the, the chops for it now, but I just, you know, I can't share the page. <laughs> we have somebody, time. somebody way up there has something. The hard thing was in the, begin uh, in the beginning of the story because uh, there were a couple of beats, and we, we still struggle with this problem. There are a couple of beats that have to happen so that you can understand how everything's going to work together. And especially on the Seattle side, um, this guy is in grief. He has no, I, he has no forward motion in mind. And uh, when you do movies, when you do any kind of a story, you have to establish a desire line because the desire of the main character is what drives everything. And here's a guy with no desire. He just wanted to be left alone. And uh, Annie is the one who really drives the story. It kind of feels like Sam and the kid are the main characters, but Annie's the only one that actually makes anything happen by getting involved, getting on the phone, calling a detective, flying out there, doing all her stalking thing, and then finally telling Walter the truth. So that was difficult. You know, you have a guy who's upset and who doesn't really, is not in any hurry to not be upset. And he just wants to create this world for his son where, uh, you know, draw the curtains around and keep him safe. Let's not, let's not go out, you know, and, and what was it in the, 
uh, Apocalypse Now, just never leave the boat. I'm never leaving the boat. And that's sort of where he was. That was really difficult because especially when he gets studio notes, they're going, he has to be, you know, active. But this guy wasn't. And we have the same problem, you know, to solve in the musical because he can't sing a happy song the second time we see him, but there's some rule in musicals that you can't do two, un two ballads in a row. But, you know, he doesn't have, you know, I'm happy now and it doesn't work. So we battled with that. So, and, and I think we came to some good conclusions about it, but uh, that was difficult. How to, how to motivate this whole half of the movie, but the kid has a desire. As soon as the kid finds out about her, he picks it up. Was there any scenes in the movie that you were amazed how it got translated to the screen? Something like, wow, this was a real surprise. I didn't realize how it would play. Well, the scene where Rita Wilson does her number would, would never have been in any script. Uh, you don't give a three-page scene to a secondary character. Uh, they worked that out on the set, so when I saw that test screening, I went, where the hell did this come from? But it was hilarious. I mean, that's the kind of thing you can do, you know, when you're on the, on the set and, on, and in, the, in the moment. But, uh, and they improvised a lot of that until they got it right. But you can't, that, that scene would never have been written and submitted. You sort of sneak those in. So that was a total surprise. But, you know, when she was looking, when she's in the car and when she's in that uh, clam shack place watching them on the beach, I mean, I mean, that was just amazing. How It was exactly the way it was in my head when I thought of it. Uh, we always end our evening with one question. Uh, <laughs> is it the dirty word question that James? No, Milton no, that was that was the other one. Uh, that's off screen. Uh, no, I've been preparing a favorite <laughs> dirty word. Though. Just... No, it's a question of uh, as a child, do you have any special movie theater experiences that you'd like to share with us? Um, really young child, there was a theater in my hometown where they did like the Saturday morning matinees with the cartoons and everything. And I was, I think this was the first one I went to. I was really, really young, and my oldest brother is six years older than me and I don't know what the hell's going on which is pretty much my whole childhood and um, I'm standing there and he says do you want popcorn and I said sure I'll have some popcorn I didn't know that this happens you know and, and uh, he said do you want butter on it I said what are you talking about and I said and he says you want butter and so I had buttered popcorn for the first time and that was it that's my first movie theater experience I, before we even got in the room. I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, this is cool. I can do this. You know. <laughs> so that was it. But, uh, you know, in a, in a sentimental way, not a child, but um, when this came out, uh, I think it was still in the theaters like a month later. It opened at the end of June of 93. Um, <clears throat> and the anniversary of my father's death was July 22nd, uh, many years before. They died in 1970. So on July 22nd, 93, I went to a theater in Virginia where I lived, and it was still packed. It was an afternoon show. It was still completely filled, and there were only seats in the front, so I bought two tickets, and I sat next to the empty seat <coughs> and took my dad to the movies. Yeah. And, you know, at one point I looked around, I just saw all these faces. They were all engaged. I just went, you know, look at that. So that was a, from butter popcorn to that, that's what we got. Uh, I thought that's, I've never heard a better story than that. Uh, oh, cool. What, what, Phil, <laughs> Phil Robinson's coming next. Make him tell a better story than that. It's not going to happen. Field of dreams, buddy. Let's do it, man. Field of dreams. <laughs> I want to thank Jeff Art. <laughs> thank uh, you. Great. Great good day. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. I thank the Pollock Theater interns for doing a wonderful job putting this I, event I, together. Thank you for coming here tonight. Yeah, yeah. and I thank the audience, of course. Please return May 4th for our season finale, uh, which will, uh, season two finale, which will be Field of Dreams with Phil Alden Robinson. Uh, Ask so. him where Kevin Costner got that shirt. <laughs> he wears this flannel shirt in that thing that I've been looking for ever since I saw this movie. Uh, we will find These are the for things you. we got to know. I mean, screw how he wrote it. Where did that <laughs> shirt come from? That's really the only question I'm asking that night. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, and thank, thank you for you. coming, and look to see you forward again. <laughs>